All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Anna here. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Let's jump right into your background. Uh, you're a reporter at Reuters today, but kind of what did you do before uh, you started writing about fintech? Uh, actually, I was I started writing about fintech seven years ago, so it's been kind of mostly of what I've done. Um, I used to work at a paper called Financial News here in London, and it's owned by Dom Jones, so it was part of the journal franchise. Um, and when I got hired there, um, I started on the online beat, which meant I didn't have a really have a beat. And it was early fintech days. So that was up for grabs. The sort of beat reporters didn't think it was much because the deals were small. Um, and I thought it made sense to cover. I thought it was, you know, going to be bigger um, in finance because like every other industry, you know, digital was was coming in. So I started writing about that. Um, then we changed editor. The editor really believed in, in that area. And so we write, started writing more about it. And then it sort of exploded. And then I moved to Reuters. Um, I'd previously interned at Reuters in Brazil for a bit where I was covering markets. Um, so it was good because I had the sort of finance background, which I think was a good dif differentiator at the start. Often you have like fintech reporters who have tech backgrounds. And I think it's important to have the, the finance understanding to cover this in the, in the right way. Absolutely. And explain a little bit just like when people hear that you cover fintech, what exactly yeah. does that cover? Kind of where are the boundaries? Uh, Cause it's so kind of pervasive. At yeah, this point. when I started, I was only doing wholesale fintech. So like capital markets, technology, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas now it's like ev really everything. It ranges from, you know, uh, from crypto, but also peer to peer lending, or even just, you know, the tech side of banks and, you know, the tech operations or trading applications, you know, the, the whole of like, if you think of finance and technology, like really all of it. So it's kind of incredibly broad and my remit is now global. So it's even broader, but it's fun because you can, you know, write about, um, you know, central bank digital currencies, or then you can move on and write about like FinTech apps for children. It's just like the whole, the whole space. Absolutely. And so I wanted to get you to jump on real quick because uh, you broke the news last week that PayPal is jumping into uh, cryptocurrencies. Maybe talk a little bit just about, you know, when you started to hear about this and kind of how you got the confirmation that this was actually happening. So I got the confirmation because they spoke to me. It was it was a very I've, I've had more more hard to get <laughs> stories in this case. Um, so, you know, I, I, I Frankly, I know there, there'd been there'd been a story, I think a couple of months ago from Coindesk about it, right? Um, so it wasn't completely shocking to me, but I was still surprised um, because, you know, they're a big company. I've been covering them for a while because I was, I, I mean, I just moved back to London, but I was in the US. So I would cover their earnings frequently. And I remember in 2016 or seven, I think 2017, early 2017, I'd interviewed Dan Schulman. Um, it was like a sort of he came into Reuters and it was lots of reporters and editors and he, and he'd said, you know, crypto doesn't have much utility yet. So I really didn't think that they were looking at this. Obviously it's been many years since, but it was still surprising. Although, you know, once I heard more about it, what they were doing and I thought about it some more, I spoke to people, it kind of made more sense for them to do something like this. Yeah. And explain kind of what exactly are they doing? So they're going to, for, for starters, they're going to allow people to buy and sell crypto. Crypto and it's four, right? It's Bitcoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Ether. Um, but the, I think what maybe was lost on some people is that they're not going to let you buy Bitcoin and you're actually holding your Bitcoin and you can sort of move it and do whatever you want. You're buying Bitcoin, but you can't move it away from their wallet. You, you'll be able to spend um, within the PayPal network, which is a massive network, but still, you won't be able to just buy a Bitcoin with PayPal and then send it to your friend who has a Coinbase account, you know? So it's, it's slightly different than what you might expect. Um, but, you know, the massive thing, as I said, is that from start of early next year or like by mid, mid next year, you'll be able to shop with their merchants. Um, so that, that could add a lot of utility to, to Bitcoin. Absolutely. And, and what I didn't understand uh, kind of when I saw the news break is uh, how big PayPal is, right? So the numbers I read is it's got like 340 million users. It's got 25 plus million merchants. Um, and then uh, it looks like they're either the 20th or 30, 30th largest quote unquote bank by the number of deposits. And so this thing is, um, you know, everyone knows the PayPal brand, but it's just massive when you look at those numbers. I think the, the thing about PayPal is, you know, they've been around for a fintech company. They've been around for a long time. So I think people just think, oh, PayPal, it's there. I mean, but but they've ever since they spun out of eBay, they've been really growing a lot and they have a very interesting strategy of just partnering with everyone. Um, and so they have partnerships with 
all the bank, the credit card providers. And, and, you know, so, so it's not surprising that they would find another, you know, way to fund the accounts. It's, it's part of who they are now, like this idea of partnering with more company, with more companies and different forms of payments. And yeah, they're massive. I think I remember when I was writing the story, I wrote that they had done, I think, I don't want to make a mistake, but I think it was like around 200 billion in payment volumes in one quarter. And I kept going back to check because I was like, billion? Am I sh- that's that's a lot per quarter. Are we sure that it's not like per year? But yeah, they're gigantic and they're everywhere. So that's another big differentiator, right? They're, they're absolutely everywhere. Absolutely. And then talk a little bit about Venmo as a part of this, right? I think Venmo may be kind of the, the younger generation, um, kind of the newer brand, but it sounds like they also have some crypto plans for Venmo as well. Yeah. So they're going to add this capability to Venmo again, I think by mid by mid year or something like that. But in 2021, I don't remember the dates exactly. And I hadn't thought about this very carefully immediately as I wrote the story, but they've been trying. So they bought Venmo. When they bought Braintree, I think Venmo came with it. Again, I hope I'm not making too many mistakes, but it it wasn't created by them. It was acquired. So, and Venmo is free and it's been really popular with everyone. Like it's just, everyone has it in the US, Um, but it doesn't make a lot of money, right? So they've been trying to make it generate some revenue. At the same time, they've seen like increased competition from Cash App and Cash App has been allowing Bitcoin purchases for a while. So it kind of makes sense. They've been seeing how Cash App has been making quite a lot of money from Bitcoin. So it makes sense that they might see this as a way to gen- help them generate some revenue and become a bit more self-sustainable. So, it, you know, it makes sense. And then you have a younger sort of type of profile of people in Venmo. So, you know, it's smart. For sure. It makes complete sense. And um, I, what was interesting to me is uh, kind of you wrote the original article, right, saying, hey, this is happening. Everyone goes wild uh, in kind of the Bitcoin and crypto world, um, which has got to be a unique experience. I'm sure most of your articles don't have these rabid fan bases uh, kind of no. attached to the No, so I, I, it's very funny. Like when you write a positive, like a story that's not even like, I mean, it's positive for Bitcoin, but I wasn't saying like, Bitcoin's going to hit the moon. Like, it gets so much new followers. And then if you do spend like six months working on an investigation about a crypto project, you just get haters and like your followers decrease. So I think every now and again, I'm, I'm just supposed to tweet out a very positive story. <laughs> just tweet the word Bitcoin and you'll, you'll be a fan favorite for yeah. sure. Uh, um, in, in terms of, uh, the reaction from the market. So not kind of the, the Twitter verse, if you will, but the actual kind of financial players. Uh, it looked like you got kind of a mixed response, right? Because there was articles where people were saying, hey, look, this is a big deal. And, and this is something to pay attention to. But then you also had an article where there were some experts saying like, and eh, it, you know, it's interesting, but it, it's not really gonna have that material of an impact. Maybe talk a little bit about that balance. Yeah. So obviously, the first reaction was like, this is great for Bitcoin. And I, and I imagine that it would send the price higher up because in effect, like there's been many big companies that have tried to give utility to Bitcoin. So, you know, Dell was one that I'd spoken to in 2017 and they'd quietly rolled it back. And then, you know, there have been ways to pay with Bitcoin, but there's this big tension between, you know, Bitcoin as a way to invest and Bitcoin as a way to spend. Um, So originally, like the price went up, but then I was speaking to sort of experts in digital payments and many of them were saying, you know what, it's not clear that this will be great for Bitcoin. Um, or it, or more, not really great for Bitcoin, but great for Bitcoin as a form of payment, right? Because it could still be that, first of all, first of all, there's that closed loop thing that we talked about before, right? Where you're not really able to take it out of the PayPal network. So it has a limited effect on the whole market. And then also, like, people might not want to spend it anyways, because if you think that the price is going to go up, why are you going to buy something with it, right? You're going to keep it. But what they were saying is that it might actually have more impact for sort of digital currencies in general. And that's what also PayPal was telling me that they're doing it because they want to get in, give more utility to cryptocurrencies, but they also want to prepare for when there are central bank digital currencies. And that's sort of what the experts were, some experts were telling me saying, you know, this is pretty smart because they're positioning themselves ahead of everyone else. Um, if this starts to happen, if, 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 you know, you see the Euro, the sort of crypto dollar, or the virtual Euro, or, you know, then they've already have that integrated within their system. Um, so yeah, so it might not have seen, it might not be, have that huge impact as you think, but I think it's sort of undeniable that it's brought it more, you know, it's making it more mainstream because now people who have a PayPal account, they might not have really paid attention to Bitcoin, but it just shows up. Right. So it, it is a, you know, even just image wise, it's, it's a big deal. 
Absolutely. And, and talk a little bit about central bank digital currencies, right? Yeah. You, you have kind of this unique position in the market where your job is literally to go talk to as many people as possible and kind of always know what's happening. What are you hearing on uh, the central bank digital currency side, either from market participants or maybe even central bankers themselves? So I think there everyone's really busy and there are many projects going on, but I have sort of this existential doubt. I don't know if it's if it's like the blockchain enterprise blockchain projects in early days. Um, I'm trying to figure that out. Is it just, you know, everyone saying we're doing something out of like a knee-jerk reaction from Libra, right? They freaked out Libra. Do we want a private social network who maybe had a, a hand in like messing up elections to sort of now decide who, like to have power over like the global currency? So they all said they were doing stuff and, and there are some projects that are live, but I don't know. I think it's crucial to see like, will they be used and, you know, even like the bigger currencies, how long will it take? And like, will they have, will they look at all like crypto or not really? Will it, they just be something different? But yeah. there's and definitely it, more people talking about it. Yeah. For sure. And, and it feels like um, one perspective of the world, and, and you're kind of alluding to this earlier, is like somebody like a PayPal uh, yeah. event, eventually gets everyone a digital wallet inside their system. So whether you're a user, a merchant, whatever, uh, today that's for cryptocurrencies, uh, Bitcoin, et cetera. But eventually, if central bank digital currencies become real, you already have the infrastructure there. And it almost feels like the switching cost between uh, going from Bitcoin to a central bank digital currency and back, that, that friction will be so low uh, and they can use the same infrastructure for everything. Yeah, I think I think that's the point. I think, but I think there's the the central bank digital currencies are work in progress. So I don't know how much they can like work ahead to know what infrastructure they'll they'll need. There was a story from I think Bloomberg towards the end of Friday or or maybe Thursday about PayPal buying Bitco or talking to buy. So that that's very different, right? Because then they would be cust like the idea I suppose is that they want to be able to custody these things. So then it would be slightly different from, you know, what they've set up now. But they've they've said that it's sort of a work in progress and they want to have like interoperability between wallets. So I think it all remains to be seen. And also, like, I, as I mentioned, you know, I mentioned Libra, sort of PayPal was an early, it was a founding member and they, they were the first ones to leave. So I wonder how much of this is sort of a, a reaction to that, right? To, you know, they believed in the idea of digital currencies, but they didn't like the way that was going. So they've still decided to go ahead in their own way. Yeah, one of the things I, I don't know the answer to, but but it's interesting to think through is uh, Facebook kind of very courageously came out and they were the first company to really spearhead this idea of like a private currency, uh, but still centralized in nature in terms of there was a, a company where you could call in the CEO or call in somebody that was running the project uh, and it was a brand that was recognizable. Uh, I wonder because of the government response, both in the United States and elsewhere, if that kind of scared a lot of these companies away and they basically are now saying, uh, we probably can't do the private currency thing so we might as well just use the existing kind of decentralized versions yeah and and speaking to sort of dan uh, schulman from, from paypal he was very much talking about how they've been speaking to regulators we've been working with regulators like he said regulators very many times and it, and to me to be fair i was quite surprised that there were like i think it was mastercard visa and paypal were the big financial companies in that because considering how the project was announced there was very little clarity on you know, if they've gotten if they would gotten go ahead from regulators, which in the end they hadn't. So I was surprised that companies that are already like big financial companies and are aware of like the sort of massive, you know, um, input from regulators that you need to have that they just jumped in without like checking with anyone before. And so in the end, you know, they left. So, it, you know, it, I think now they probably yes, as you say, they're probably thinking we're going to go ahead, but, you know, we're going to do it with governments and you know, they're a lot more cautious. Absolutely. You um, you don't just write about crypto, Bitcoin. Um, you write about fintech in general. What are some of the other fintech trends that you're seeing kind of play out as COVID and, and all of that impact plays? So obviously there's this sort of digital payment side of things, which is partly crypto, but like more broad, you know, there's been a massive upsurge in, in, in digital payments and digital banking in general because of lockdowns globally. So we're seeing more activity there. And uh, more companies sort of growing and also reaching big valuations. Uh, and it, it's generally one of the, I guess, biggest trends. Um, and then also like online trading is also growing. You know, we've seen like Robinhood and the like uh, have an explosive year. So that's something else that, that we're watching. Uh, and then in general, you know, from the bank perspective also, you know, they, they were all in the process of 
transforming digitally, but now because they've had to shut down their branches, they had to, and also like their offices, if you think about the wholesale, wholesale side of the business, they've obviously, they're telling us that they've had to accelerate the pace of digital transformation. Um, and it, you know, things that would have taken them a month or two months, they, they did in like two days. Um, so overall, it's like, I guess it's been great for fintech generally, obviously there've been areas that are not doing great with like lending. Uh, clearly it's a bit of a rough moment for lending because, you know, lots of people are having a very tough time. So, you know, people are expect expecting more loan lab losses. Absolutely. And it feels almost like uh, kind of the financialization of everything is upon us, right? And you're getting kind of any company that touches money, which is almost every company, somehow they're starting to play in this like fintech type world. Um, and then the fintech companies are also becoming much more pervasive in terms of it used to just be, hey, we want to have a neo bank, right? But now we're seeing brokers, we're seeing cards, we're seeing kind of the, the uh, software companies trying to almost eat the traditional financial uh, system. H how do you kind of balance this in your head? Is it going to be where uh, people are going to come from different perspectives, but everyone's going to end up in just this digital finance world? So it doesn't matter if you're a Wall Street incumbent, a technology company, a crypto company, like we're all headed to the same place? I think so. I think inevitably, slowly, it's going to end up being more like that. I think obviously there's always going to need, need there, you'll always need a little bit of a physical presence because I mean, for, for consumers, you think less about it, but if you're a small business and you take cash, I mean, it's, unless cash disappears, but for, for, for a while, you'll still need to have a little bit of an out physical outpost, right? But yeah, it's, I find it interesting that you have like big tech finance, tech firms coming in and doing finance things, you know, like Apple doing the Apple card with Goldman. And then you have like the fintechs that were like, as you say, you had Robinhood saying, we're just a brokerage. And then they started launching an account or, you know, Wealthfront doing the same or SoFi doing trading. You know, it's, it's just everybody doing everything. And it's funny because early days of fintech was unbundling. And now I guess they figured out people don't want to have 50 apps on their phone for their financial life. And so we have a big rebundling of fintech. And I guess, the winners will be who wins the rebundling, I suppose. And, and some banks, the bigger ones in the U.S., who have all the money they need to become more digital, they'll probably still remain winners. I don't see like them disappearing in the short term. But, you know, the smaller fintechs, some of them might not be able to remain sustainable, right? Yeah, it's really interesting, too, I think, to think through um, kind of the geographic boundaries that were really prevalent in uh, kind of the legacy financial world. Those seem to be going away a little bit as well, because in the digital world, uh, yes, you start to pay attention to the regulations. But uh, when you don't have to have a physical location, it makes it much easier to kind of go other places, right? And kind of have yeah. this like cloud-based solution. Yeah, it, it definitely is. Only I think the regulation is sort of like, undeniable and something that stops you more than anything right because you know you need a license to be somewhere else right and you need to have and that license maybe comes with rules about having people there so whereas you know like other types of tech like tiktok can like take over the world in like what six i don't even know when they were launched but you know you robin hood was supposed to come to the uk but decided not to because i think the step of expanding in another country when you're a financial cup when you're in another country when you're a financial company is just that much harder right so um so it, it's it's going to happen but i think slowly i think probably what's happening is that globally we're all becoming more similar in the types of services we use like everybody's becoming more like and I guess it depends, like developed and developing markets, but you know, we're all using the same types of services, but they're more still a bit more localized, right? There's the equivalent of Robinhood somewhere else and, and so forth, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that Jack Dorsey kind of highlighted this the best, right? I heard him one time say uh, what really excites him about Bitcoin specifically is this idea of with uh, Square and Cash App, if he wants to go into a new country, he has to do all sorts of things around uh, banking regulations, getting people onboarded, KYC, AML, like, you know, really, really in-depth kind of legacy type stuff. He's like, with Bitcoin, it's immediately available in that new country, right? And now, yes, there's probably going to be more regulation over time around it. But um, I think that was a really unique perspective from somebody who's kind of playing in both worlds, right? He, he's a big proponent of Bitcoin, but he also understands uh, kind of the bureaucracy and, and pain of, of moving a legacy uh, company kind of country by country for expansion. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of like pretty, you know, having covered finance also broadly for so long, I just think the, the regulatory part is inevitable. And like, if the more like, you know, widespread you get, the more you're going to have like 
controls around it. If you see in the UK, they've now like, you can't, I think it's with derivatives, you can't, retail investors can't touch crypto derivatives. So it's, it's just the way of things, right? Because you need to protect some consumers and not others. So I think it's true. I think maybe crypto has sort of given people the impulse to realize that stuff needs to be a bit more swift and quick and you need to have better ways of doing things, whether that translates in the existing cryptos taking over the world or just new forms of like payments improving, then, you know, that, that remains to be seen, I guess. Absolutely. Before I let you go, I ask everybody the same two questions uh, and then you'll get to ask me one to finish up. Uh, the first one is what is the most important book that you've ever read? <gasps> Oh no, this is very hard. Um, oh, I don't know. I can I can say which ones I liked that I keep thinking. Okay. I don't know. Um, Even two or three of them, just ones that come to the oh, top no. of your head. I, I I'm so bad with questions like this. It's when they ask me like, "What are you working on?" I don't remember. Um, I love. I mean, these are not like business books, though. It's fine. Answer, okay. Of I'm going to be like really banal, but I loved Americana, like uh, still one of my favorite books. Um, why did you like that one? I just loved it. I just thought it was like so smart and like it touched on like really important topics, but it was just like love. It was just a lovely read also on top of everything. Yeah, very well written. Yeah. Yeah. Um, God, I loved... Um, oh, I don't remember the name. It was the one about a journalist and he, he need, started working in Silicon Valley for a bit and he was doing content. I think it was Disrupted maybe it was called. I don't remember the name. I don't remember. No. It's really bad book recommendation and I'm so bad with remembering things, but it was great because it was just like, I think being a journalist, it was like looking inside a uh, sort of the startup world from within as a journalist. So it makes me think, will I ever want to work in a startup? I don't know. Cause look at this guy, what happened? Like it was just, I just loved it. It was very funny. Obviously if I remember the name, it was better. I remember the cover, but not, the name and then I think I also liked um one of in just general Michael Lewis books I think the early fantastic. ones fantastic yeah yeah I just I just like those they're they're fun but they're also about finance so you learn things yeah but yeah he, he's one of the best for sure uh second question is a little bit more fun which is aliens are you a believer or non-believer I don't know I am a, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I, I'm a non-believer until I see evidence. Let's say that. <laughs> I haven't seen sufficient evidence to believe. I also don't really think about it very much. I'm like too worried about everything going on in the world. To think about <laughs> other worlds. That that's probably the best reason to not be worried about what's going on off Earth, right? Is we got enough yeah. of our own problems here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. Uh, you could ask me one question to finish up. What do you got for me? What would be your dream guest, like the one you'd like love to have, but is almost impossible? Oh, it, it will obviously it'd have to be somebody who's dead. Um, I would say one of the people I've been fascinated with my whole life, and I don't know where this fascination came from, uh, is John Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a really interesting conversation, especially in uh, if, if we had all of the hindsight clarity that we have now about what he did, how he did it, what he built, how important oil became, kind of, you know, all of that. And then to be able to ask him, like, hey, man, <laughs> tell us all this stuff. Like, why did you do this? How did it work? You know, would you go back and change anything? Those types of questions, I think, would be really mm -hmm. fascinating for somebody who, you know, one, amassed a, a great fortune, but two, did it in a, in a very kind of... Um, uh, it did it in a way that I think today a lot of people try to emulate in terms of like standardizing industries and, and kind of building these very powerful, uh, almost monopolistic type uh, type companies. Do you think he'd be a Bitcoin believer? Yeah, I tend to think that a lot of those early people weren't uh, weren't the biggest fans of uh, of kind of centralized planned uh, type of <laughs> currencies. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, or maybe that's my bias just telling me that they would be. But uh, but yeah, him, J.P. Morgan, etc. I think uh, you know they tend to be a little bit more uh, disruptive and innovative than, uh, than yeah. Not. yeah. Where um where where can we send people to find you uh, on the internet or uh, find some of your work? So you can follow me at on Twitter at. at and my last name, and then my stories are all on borders.com. But I'll post, I post everything, so 
the Twitter is the easiest way. Twitter's the best one. All right. Listen, Anna, thank you so much for doing this. I think that uh, people are really fascinated with the PayPal news. And uh, obviously, uh, you got the story out first, which is always uh, a <laughs> as well. So uh, thanks for doing yeah. this and we'll have to do it again. Thank you. Thank you.